Well, it's good to see so many people staying, good to see so many trainees here. Uh, Eurolink's 25 years old this year. It was uh, established after a, uh, a meeting uh, and set up in 1991 and became a committee in 1996, so 20 years ago. So very timely to consider what we've achieved and uh, where we're going in the future. And I think it's an exciting time for the likes of Eurolink, uh, and I'll allude to that in the, in the presentation that I'm going to give. And on my right are friends and colleagues who've uh, had time in East Africa this year. Eurolink isn't exclusively an East African uh, uh, focus. We're, we're very open and welcoming to anyone else who uh, has links or would like to visit other low-income or middle-income countries, and we'd be very supportive. So I'll um, make my presentation, and uh, I'll take questions on my presentation at the end, and we'll try and see if we can catch up. So the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery was established in uh, 2015, and really look to set the seeds after the, the Millennium Development Goals had run their course, and it was recognised that uh, surgery was the orphan child, really, of international health care. I'm going to uh, run a short video uh, from the Lancet, and uh, then a few slides. <clears throat> Over the past two decades, global health has focused on individual diseases. Surgical care has been afforded low priority in the world's poorest regions, leaving five billion people without access to safe, affordable surgical and anesthesia care. Patients requiring surgical treatment will face multiple hurdles. Delay in seeking care. Delay in reaching care. Delay in receiving care. Reaching the hospital does not guarantee treatment, as many lack the proper infrastructure to provide emergency surgical care. As a result, many easily treatable conditions become diseases with high fatality rates. As many as 90% of maternal deaths could be averted by timely intervention. For those who successfully obtain treatment, one quarter will experience financial catastrophe as a result of receiving surgical care. To save lives and prevent disability, an additional 143 million surgical procedures are required annually in developing countries. Today's surgical workforce would need to double in 15 years to reach our target of 80% coverage of timely access to essential services by 2030. The total costs required to reach these targets are significant at approximately $350 billion by 2030. However, the costs of failure are even greater. The lost output will cost developing countries an estimated $12.3 trillion. Investing in surgical services is affordable, saves lives and promotes economic growth, making surgery an indivisible, indispensable part of healthcare. So a real impetus, really, to, to, to project m more surgical services into low-income and middle-income countries. And I'll discuss what I think Rural Link's role may be in that. Just to look at um, the Lancet, ha has run several other commissions, but um, the, the presentation at the Royal College of Surgeons in April by the, the um, editor was, was very uh, uh, compelling. Those are the four domains that they feel really require focus. And I think information management, in other words, what's the current status of surgical provision and what impact does improving surgical services have is something that we could help with and obviously workforce training and education. Finance and economics and healthcare delivery are really the business of government. A big document. A nice... Uh, representation of surgery in the world, with red being obviously very low uh, numbers of surgeons per head of population. And you can see that Africa dominates, but particularly West Africa. <coughs> Those are some more numbers to go with that. And here, again, the same point. The numbers on the right showing 
better numbers of surgeons per head of population in the east of Africa with much less well su supported provision in the west. Again, emphasizing that. We've been through that. This, this concept of uh, economic catastrophe for the individual patient, because in most of these countries, they'll end up paying for their care, and that can often exceed their annual income. So that needs to be addressed along with the provision of more surgery. We've seen those numbers. So where do I think we're going with Euralink? Well, I think we need to start planning, and part of the commission was very much that this should be an effort of the Royal College, well, the colleges, the Royal College of Surgeons in England have taken a, a, a big lead on this, led by an orthopaedic surgeon from Oxford called Chris, Chris Lavery, who's also had a lot of interest in surgery provision in East Africa. And we are going to go to the COSEXA meeting, which is the, the, surgeons or, uh, the surgical uh, college of East Africa, uh, and uh, start conversations with them about how the two colleges can work together to set what, to, to establish what provision there is on the ground, to establish what needs to be done to improve training and uh, get more surgeons delivering care in that part of the world. Obviously, we're focusing on East Africa. We don't want to be exclusive, but we've got time-limited resources. And if there are others in the room who have familiar with East Af uh, West Africa, clearly that would be a priority as well. We need to have a clear curriculum about what we're trying to deliver. This isn't about teaching radical prostatectomy. It is clear about delivering emergency urology, about important conditions, and there are 44 key procedures that have been described in the Lancet Commission, although I suspect we could expand on that slightly in urology. And then there is a, set, a question of, and should there be an assessment and accreditation process, and obviously that would be led through the colleges. So I'm going to uh, stop there. I, I don't want to take questions at this point in time. There may be well, well be issues uh, that um, my colleagues are going to address, uh, and uh, I'll take questions at the end. Thank you. So first up is um, uh, Sushim um, uh, uh, Aslam, who uh, had time in Ethiopia and is going to tell us about his experience there. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. So I'm Zishan, a specialist uh, registrar in urology, currently working in Morriston Hospital. And I've been involved with Euroling over the last 12 months working in Ethiopia. A couple of times I visited. So in this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, what Eurolink has been doing in Ethiopia <coughs> and how it all started, my own experience, and what we have achieved so far. I'm also going to tell you about what our future goals are um, uh, planned for in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia is situated in the Horn of uh, Africa. The place where we work is uh, called as Hawassa, which is in the southern part of uh, Ethiopia, about 300 kilometers from Addis Ababa, which is the capital city. Unfortunately, Ethiopia is known uh, to the world for lack of basic necessities of life and the worst form of famine and droughts that could affect the human generations. For those who are involved, this country is also known for its outstanding natural beauty and landscape, for producing the world's best long distance runners, and probably the finest coffee that you would ever taste if you visit there. So Hawassa Referral Hospital was built in 2005, and it serves a population of the whole southern Africa, southern Ethiopia, which is about 20 million. Uh, there are 400 beds, and 60 of them are surgical, and there are 10 to 12 urology beds, uh, urology patients, which are there at a the time. This is a very busy place, performing about 1,500 major surgical operations in one year. Ethiopia is a huge country with a population of almost 100 million, and majority of that, about 85% lived in the rural areas. The life expectancy is in mid to, 50, uh, mid to high 50s. The under five mortality rate is an astonishing 123 out of 1,000. Almost 700 women out of 100,000 lose their life during childbirth. 
There are 2,000 doctors serving 180 hospitals, uh, 160 of them are surgeons, and the total number of qualified urologists are only eight. Before Ulang started its activities, there were very limited urological services with one general surgeon who had limited training in uh, India. Uh, patients, they were referred to the capital for endoscopic procedures, uh, lithotripsy, and other complex surgery. The two most common problems that we encounter are BPH and urethral strictures. Uh, there's no pharmacological treatment for BPH, uh, of course, due to the cost, and there was no endoscopic services. So open transvesical prostatectomy uh, has been the treatment of choice for BPH, and blind dilatation of strictures uh, was used for, stricture, for, uh, for the stricture <coughs> disease. Yearling activities in Hawassa were started in 2010 by Mr. Shekhar Bayani, uh, our yearling coordinator for uh, Ethiopia, with the short to midterm goals of providing training in lower unit tract endoscopic procedures. Uh, in March 2010, the initial assessment was done, followed by upgrading of the endoscopic equipment, which were very well supported by Olympus and stores. And following that, we had the initiation of training. Over the last six years, there has been seven different uh, yearling visits by teams comprising of other uh, consultants, uh, most noticeable Mr. Graham Watson, Mr. Badra Kumar, uh, while Jamin, Joby, and Tom went there as urological trainees. More recently, Mo, Mo Aldewani, who is one of our core trainees, was involved, and Sister Denise Illis from uh, Pinderfields Hospital in Wakefield provided training to the theater staff. Training has been provided in the form of a skills workshop, formal lectures, hands-on surgical training, and teaching of his students and his staff. We have, Yearling has used all forms of models um, from dummies to potatoes to provide uh, training and enhance their skills. I've been there twice last year, both with uh, Mr. Graham Watson, who has, uh, has a wise experience of providing training all across East to West Africa, not just with Yearling, but also with, uh, through his own, uh, own charity organization. The two key figures in uh, Hawassa, Dr. Abira Gubis, a very uh, respected senior general surgeon, and Dr. Gatni Tifiri, who is a trainee, due to become a consultant next year. Enormous potential and a very, very uh, bright future for Ethiopian uh, urology. The goals for the trip is to provide training in low tract endoscopic procedures, teach the medical students, initiate the audit work, and in the instrument checks, which is a regular part of every Eurolink visit. Uh, the preparations were the same, vaccinations, anti-malarial reading previous reports, and collecting the theater equipment, which is not in, in use, uh, has been really helpful, and you just realize it uh, when you get there and, and uh, supply the theater. Our typical day in Hawassa started uh, with the morning ward rounds around eight o'clock. Following that, we had theater sessions, which normally last up to three to 4 p.m. Uh, we had post-operative ward rounds and seeing the next day's patients. On certain days, we had uh, teaching sessions with the university students. And in the evening, we just used to get our well-deserved reward by relaxing by the wonderful Lake Hawassa. Currently, we are doing TURs, about 50 to 60 grams prostate, which are done all in dextrose. There is no glycine available. WHO checklist, TRP checklist, they are all uh, well in use and strictly followed. Guide wires, Alex, loops, rolly balls, they are all reused after being uh, cleaned and decontaminated with, um, uh, with glutaryl aldehyde. Ultrasound is very commonly available. Uh, CT is less frequent, though. Uh, IVU uthrography, once again, is very easily available. Um, surprisingly, there are not many anesthetic doctors in Ethiopia, and those who are are based in, um, in the capital. In Hawassa, these services are provided by trained anesthetic nurses who are doing a remarkably useful jobs and which deserves all, all the respects. Main urology theaters, they are equipped with the, most of the essential stuff that is needed for both open and endoscopic surgery. Uh, in the picture on the right, you can see the anesthetic nurses, they like to perform spinal anesthetic on all patients because they find it easier to manage post-operatively. Uh, the main theater corridors, um, which, is, which is leading to all the main, main, uh, three main theaters, uh, has got the scrubbing area uh, present outside the theaters as well. Uh, drapes, they are reusable ones. Uh, clearly, uh, the disposable has uh, cost, effect, uh, cost, cost issues. And that is where, at times, you can lose some of the training time as uh, um, 
we, are, we struggle to wash them because of issues uh, with the laundry for several reasons. Um, in the picture on the right, uh, you can see the corners of the door, um, on, the, on the corners of the picture, the edges of the door. Uh, basically what it depicts is that we don't have a modern ventilation mechanism so far, so all the theaters operate with the doors open and that provides some form of uh, ventilation. Training is provided in the, in the normal way as we do here, one-to-one -one trainer to training. Um, uh, we just talk through the procedure and intervention and demonstration um, to the trainee as and when required. Uh, as a trainee, uh, I got an opportunity to get some open surgical experience as well. And in the picture, you can see uh, it was almost 140 cc prostate, which Dr. Abera had supervised me to perform a transvesical prostatectomy on. Um, interesting to note that uh, this was performed with an additional light from the bicycle headlamps, which you can see in the picture, which were, I think, which were bought from the pound shop. Uh, but it did the job perfectly. Uh, on the right, uh, Dr. Bear likes to use the secure, uh, a drain bag uh, is replaced by a surgical glove, again due to the cost, and once again, it does the job really well. Uh, Mr. Watson uh, performing another procedure, and um, now innovation is really necessary to surviving in these environments. Uh, I remember on the picture on the right that while I went away to find the skin hooks in another theater, Dr. Bear has invented his own skin hook by bending a blunt needing and attaching it to the syringe, which again did the job really well. And uh, I don't think the actual skin hooks were really used in this procedure. Uh, these are some of the students, and uh, now this is, was probably the most uh, beautiful part of the whole trip. It was really good to know these students, really shy to begin with, but once you get to know them, they are extremely enthusiastic and knowledgeable, and it was an absolute pleasure working with them. So what has Euralink achieved so far in Hawassa? Um, the two surgeons there have achieved an independent level of competency in lower intract endoscopic procedures. Uh, audit work has been initiated, and more importantly, our resident has realized the significance of uh, doing audit work. Uh, the theater staff training continues that get tested on each trip, and uh, the university students' teaching has been initiated. Uh, general surgeons who are interested in Euralink, they get supported as well. Um, we have a general surgeon who has recently been to Vellore in India, uh, Christian Medical Center, which is one of the biggest uh, training institutes in the whole subcontinent. Uh, equipment donation has been done, and we uh, like to maintain it very well. And most importantly, recently, through BJU International, some funding has been approved to support these uh, workshops in the future. Uh, our future goals involves training in urethroplasty, uh, training in stone disease uh, with PCNLs and urethroinoscopies procedure, and we would work toward developing Hawassa as the second training center for urology in Ethiopia. So for those who are starting to make up their mind, joining us soon, uh, it's important to know that uh, Hawassa is uh, it's not a barren piece of land. It's a fast developing major Ethiopian city. There's a modern airport under construction. So the distance between Addis and uh, Hawassa would be just a matter of less than, a, less than an hour. The health ministry is supporting the hospital projects uh, very uh, enthusiastically. There is a new theater in, in progress. And uh, there are other surgical specialities supported by various groups as well. From within UK, vascular surgery department is being supported. Uh, the Gwent Link, in, uh, once again, in South Wales, is supporting Ops and Gynae. And the University of Wisconsin is supporting the Gynae department as well. In fact, during our last visit in December, the faculty was there present at the same time. And an Australian group is recently involved in developing the trauma and orthopedic uh, unit. How can you uh, help with the Eurolink and our project in Ethiopia? You can train in the endoscopic procedures. If you are a trainee at a much junior level, you can get involved with research and audit work, teaching medical students and residents. And by being based in UK, you can help residents with providing them teaching materials, journal articles, and all sorts. What would you gain uh, as a trainee uh, an exposure to different country, culture, climate? Uh, it enhances your clinical skill and judgments as you are working in an environment with the same disease but with a lot of limited facilities. Uh, exposure to open surgery uh, would, be, uh, would be always welcome and useful. And uh, the most beautiful of all is the new professional friendships that you develop. Um, and in addition, uh, what what I would feel, what I felt is it adds a different dimension to your speciality as a urological trainee here. Uh, you just realize that as being a urological trainee, it could be more about uh, just, just putting about the indicative numbers and there's a lot more you can do while being a trainee. Uh, and so many soft skills like leadership and communication that you could develop. 
that is all, and thank you very much from our whole team in Hamasa. Thanks very much, Zishan. A really um, helpful insight into what's going on. I think we can take a limited number of questions. Has anyone got a question for Zishan? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, invite Chris Parker to give his views. He attended the Eurolink workshop in um, Tanzania with us in November, and I'm sure he's going to give us his useful insight and honest appraisal. You're here at the Eurolink session, and so most of you will know about KCMC, but not all, perhaps. So KCMC is the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center. It's just on the outskirts of Moshi in northern Tanzania, and most people would know Moshi better for the fact that it's one of the places you start off your trek to climb Kilimanjaro. And, and this was the morning's view on the way to the hospital from our hotel. And KCMC is a regional hospital. It's on a large campus. It has all the specialties you would expect. It has one of half a dozen medical schools in Tanzania. It has a big nursing school. It has schools of all sorts of things. And I can remember walking past the building that housed the School of um, Medical Records Training. The medical school is a multi-story medical school, modern, very well appointed. We were taken around it. And in the library area, I saw the largest collection of Mac desktop computers I've ever seen. There must have been well over 100. So very well appointed. And um, why is Eurolink associated with KCMC? Well, many of you will know because of the Jacob Eshelman Urology Workshop, which goes on every other year over a period of about a week. Uh, and most recently, Phil Thomas, uh, David Dickerson, and Susie Venn go over and carry out complex urethral and complex genital reconstructions, together with some other European surgeons, usually from the Netherlands, performing pediatric reconstruction. Why would I be there? I'm a general urologist, trained traditionally. I could probably do the curriculum that Phil was talking about of basic urological things, but why I'm not a specialist urethral reconstructor. <coughs> well, there are three reasons, really. One is I've always wanted to go and work in a developing country, but not as a specialist going there on short visits. I wanted to do something that was rather more long term. Secondly, I went to the RSM urology section winter meeting uh, that Roger Playle organized in Zanzibar 18 months ago. And as well as visiting uh, the hospitals that Rue McDonald's um, um, charity manage, I also met Frank Bright, who is now the urologist at KCMC. And he was saying that there had been three urologists. The senior one had retired, the other had moved away, and that left him. And he was struggling. And he was struggling with teaching the trainees. He was struggling with teaching the medical students. He said that they had a system where one of them would go away for a number of days a week to a, 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 a far away um, facility um, where they would provide urology. And he wasn't able to do that. And he could do with some help. So I thought, well, that's probably the sort of help that I could, uh, I could do. And the third thing was that Susie was, I think, thinking along the same lines. He'd had a conversation with her. So I ended up with a group of other people here uh, at KCMC. And as part from the usual suspects, suspects of Phil, Susie, and David there, there were seven other general urologists, pediatric urologists. The urology department's actually quite modern, well-appointed. That's it in a two-story building. Upstairs is urology. The theatres... Nice, bright, there were two main theatres, one smelt of new paint, the other one was rather more cramped. Modern equipment, they just had a donation of a bipolar diathermy and TURP set, which they were very pleased with. You can see there the irrigation solution made on site and poured into a, a big drum there to be used. So, so good facilities. Clearly, when you're on a workshop, you get a slanted view of what goes on in the department. But looking through their operating log, it was mostly cystoscopy, urethroplasty, urethrotomy, uh, some pediatric genitoscrotal surgery, and TURPs. 
So the sort of things that I could do, I could help train with. The equipment was perfectly adequate and, and up to date. But what did we do while we were there and while our expert colleagues were doing the reconstructions? Well, this was the teaching room. And we had live links to the operating theatres. You could freely go in and out of the operating theatres in scrubs. And each of the non-specialists gave some sort of presentation or led a discussion about cases. During this period, clearly, we went on ward rounds. We talked to the trainees. We got an idea about what their needs might be. And from the needs from the trainees, of which there were about half a dozen senior trainees from Tanzania and the rest of East and Southern Africa, was that they, well, they were quite hesitant about talking to us. Uh, Phil, David, and, uh, and Susie said that they're actually the most vocal group that they'd come across. But they pointed out quite realistically that they were going to go off into single-handed practice somewhere and they would quite like to have someone to comment critically on their skills, doing a cystoscopy, teach them how to do a TURP, and, and, and so critical analysis. Also, my impression, and this is a very personal one, is that when we went on ward rounds, they had a fairly narrow diagnostic tree thought process. If you're an adult male with voiding problems, and at cystoscopy you didn't have a urethral stricture, you needed a TURP. And so I think that perhaps some of their, some teaching about uh, widening their diagnostic tree could be helpful. Then there's the students. This is the group of medical students here, as usual, sitting at the back, not understanding really very much what was going on on the video there, but slightly hesitant when one approached them, but then within a matter of a few minutes, crowding around and being very, very happy to be taught. And my understanding is that, in a fairly traditional way, the senior trainees there teach the junior trainees, and the junior trainees teach the medical students. So could general UK urologists have something to help there? Yes. But then, the, oh, sorry, then the third thing is Frank Bright himself, single-handed urologist, um, struggling. So could we help? Yes, we could and there were a group of us who were willing to. But on reflection, when I came back, I had some concerns about the obstacles. Of course, things develop slowly. If you offer some help, it doesn't mean that there is a commitment to accept that offer. But I had certain concerns about whether we could develop things more. It was very difficult to pin Frank down during the week as to what he would actually want and how it might work. Secondly, he actually did have some help. There was a chap called Jacques, who was a Dutch urologist, senior urologist, had worked a lot in Africa, and in fact had been there for about three months. And in private conversations with Jacques, it appeared that he'd never been contacted out of hours about a case. They always contacted Frank. Frank had said to me, I'd quite like to have a holiday. Jacques had been there three, for three months. Frank hadn't taken the opportunity to take a holiday. Now, of course, there are very many reasons why you might want to not go away, why you might not want to give up control of your department, but uh, it made me wonder about the, the real need and, and the enthusiasm for support from us. And then the, the other aspect was, this is a big hospital. We had the management come and introduce themselves to us. They must have many, many calls on their funding. And what concerns me slightly is that if a group of UK urologists went out and supported the training in the department, that might allow the management to invest elsewhere rather than investing in a second and one hopes third urologist. So finally, would I do it again? Well, that's the view from our hotel roof of Kilimanjaro. Yes, I would. I'd be happy to go out there at a time when there wasn't a workshop to really explore whether there was an opportunity to help them. And in fact, as it turns out, one of our number is part going out for a week in the autumn as part of a trip to, to Africa. Uh, and so we may get some feedback then about whether there's any mileage in taking this forward. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. As I expected, insightful and honest. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Chris? Thanks, Chris. Um, next up, um, if we could have Nick Campion, who's um, going to be giving us some insight into uh, how he was involved in training 
residents in neurological emergencies. Thank you. <clears throat> um, good afternoon. So my name is Nick Campaign. I'm a trainee in the Southwest uh, Deanery. And I'm going to talk about the MSC course, which is Management of Surgical Emergencies, which was actually designed by uh, Bob Lane, um, who's past president of ASGBI. And I'll come on to the reasons why this is an important course and uh, what Eurolink's involvement with, uh, with it was. As we know, there's a very high urological burden of disease in Africa. The typical things you see are strictures, uh, BPH, and we know already there's not enough urologists to deal with this problem. To so compare Zambia, where there's one urologist for every 2.3 million people, to the numbers in the UK, which are obviously a lot better. So what that means in practice is that most urological care is given by general surgeons or clinical officers in rural areas. So that led to this course being developed, and it's, it's funded by DFID and THET, uh, set up by ASGBI in collaboration with COSEXA, and Eurolink was asked to um, become involved with, the, obviously, the urology component of the course. So the main objectives of the course were to teach uh, trainees and residents, so that's all surgical trainees and residents, how to manage common urological problems, so retention, trauma, scrotal emergencies, um, in anticipation of the workload that they'll be covering in rural areas where there isn't access to specialists or uh, senior support. It's a five-day course. Uh, the urology component was half a day, and it was run in two centres over a number of years. So those centres were Lusaka in Zambia and Nairobi in Kenya. And the urology module was, was aimed to be guided by what um, feedback from you know, urologists and surgeons working in those areas uh, told us. This table shows uh, trainees' prior experience. So on the right-hand side, that's number of procedures they've been involved with, over 20. On the left-hand column, that's no experience whatsoever. So you can see from the table that there's a wide variety of experience amongst trainees, um, but not much experience in the more complex uh, procedures like urological trauma management. So how did the workshop actually run? Well, these photos are from uh, when we went to Kenya a few years ago. Every day, a pig would arrive on the back of a motorbike and my job would be to try and harvest the uh, kidneys and bladder specimens before the general surgeons got there, whilst the rest of the team would be preparing the uh, other bits of equipment and mannequins for teaching the rest of the course. The course was taught through a variety of methods, um, with the focus being on hands-on experience and supervision on the wet lab and simulation exercises. And as part of it, there's a train the trainers course um, with the aim to make it sustainable in the long term. This was the urology module. So you could see in half a morning, you had a very short amount of time to cover all of urology, basically. And these are some photos of the course as we're going along. So the pig scrotum in the bottom left corner to use to teach testicular torsion. Uh, Dr. Abera from Ethiopia there in the bottom right teaching suprapubic catheters and then um, wet lab exercises on, on the pig's kidney in the top, top right. So what was the outcome of, of these courses? Well, they've been running since 2011, and seven courses have been delivered in total. One of those was a preliminary pilot course, but 108 residents have completed the urology module. In that time, seven local faculty from around East and Central Africa have also been trained to teach the urology module. And it has been sustainable in that in 2014, a course ran independently in Zambia without the need for any overseas funding or input or faculty. And uh, there's also been a further one more recently. So the feedback from the candidates was always uh, very good. Um, the, this slide shows the, uh, the different areas that were rated as most useful. So you can see at the top, um, suprapubic catheter, and simulate, simulation videos for procedures were rated very highly. Renal colic, uh, is not as common in the African setting, was the least, u least useful um, section. So as I've said, the participants' feedback was very positive, but as always, um, they felt, the trainees felt that we were trying to cram too much urology into too short a time, so that was the main thing to improve. But did it have any effect on the participants? So this slide shows the pre- and post-course MCQ results 
uh, for all the trainees. So the red, red line is the post course. So you can see across the, all the trainees there was an objective improvement in their urological knowledge. So that was in the short term. Did it have any lasting impact in the longer term? And this is not just for urology, this is for all, all the surgical um, specialities. But after six months, 90% of the participants said that the course had improved their ability to manage emergencies. There is some evidence that, although this is still work in progress, that the, the participants who did the course did have a higher pass rate in the COSEXA uh, membership exams, but that hasn't yet been... We need, we need to look into that in further detail. But we can say overall that it seems to be working. Uh, we hope it was responsive to learners' needs, and it was sustainable in the fact that two courses have run since without any overseas input. There have been some other outcomes. Um, it's le led to ongoing uh, collaboration with some of the centres, particularly in Zambia. And Eurolink have learned a lot from it as well. That we need the importance of being responsive to what urologists and surgeons in other parts of the world need and request training on. Uh, the use of simulation was very well received. And possibly uh, participants doing the course may have better um, pass rates in their exams. Thank you very much. And I welcome any questions. Thank you, Nick. What, what next? Nice, nice work to date. What, what, what are the plans going forward? Well, I, th I think the plans probably have to be, as, as you've said, in uh, linking everything in closer collaboration with COSEXA, because this is looking at all surgical specialities, and uh, all the feedback were from trainees was that they want dedicated you know, urology supervision and training in host institutions. So trying to maintain those links, I think, is, is the way forward. I agree. Thanks very much, Nick. So, finally, uh, Paul Anderson with some reflections on a, a urethroplasty workshop that he <coughs> attended and led. Good afternoon. Right, I sort of spend most of my time doing urethroplasty, so I was, you know, delighted to be asked to go out to um, Africa with Eurolink to set up a urethroplasty <coughs> workshop, and this is uh, my sort of reflections from going out there in April. Now, Zambia's got a population of 14 million. It's a very sort of low-income country. The life expectancy is low. This is mainly due to HIV, and therefore this skews the urological diseases that you're going to get out there. It's not going to be the same as here. There's one major centre, the University Teaching Hospital of Lusaka, which has got 1,655 beds, and it must have about the same number, again, of mattresses on the floor when you step over them on the wards. There's only one urology department dealing with the whole of the country, with three consultants. And there's two big problems, really. The one is that all prostate surgery is open, so it's a long stay in hospital with the morbidity. And secondly, strictures. Strictures are, are everywhere. And these aren't men who present with a slow urinary flow and the odd UTI. These are men turning up with a watering can perineum, or fornia's gangrene, or renal failure. It's a different level of stricture. So what Euralink wanted to do, and, and, and will do, and we, you know, we will achieve, is to, is to develop the endoscopic surgery. And there was a workshop out there earlier in the year, which I you know, wasn't part of, led by um, Sheikh Abiyani. And also, not so much to introduce urethroplasty, because they are doing urethroplasties, they're just not doing the right sort of urethroplasties. And finally, to raise the profile of urology in Zambia. So there's funding for three visits uh, for each of the, uh, the workshops to go out there. And this is the hospital. It's run down, and that's the urology block, but it's, you know, I've got nothing to uh, compare it to. It's my first visit to Africa. But the people I went with, Susie Venn and David Dickerson, have been to Africa many, many times, you know, so it was okay. So. We went out there, you know, ran the workshop on the 3rd to the 8th of April. And in that hospital, our main link is Nenad uh, Spazodrovic, a Serbian gentleman. And then you've got Basam Yani, an Egyptian uh, consultant. And finally, you've got Victor Mapilanga. And there's actually part of the problem, because you've got the Serbian guy, Nenad, on a three-year contract that gets renewed every three years. You've got Basam Yani on a three-year contract renewed every three years. And it's only Victor, who's Zambian, who's got you know, permanent status in the hospital. The urology department doesn't stand alone either. 
it's sucked into the whole you know, group of surgery. They haven't got their own theatre, their own ward, or their own area for you know, minor procedures. I thought the theatres were okay. Um, and the wards, although basic, uh, you know, there's a, a good level of hygiene on there. The nurses were around in the daytime. We weren't there at night time. And, and you can see the mattresses on the floor. So that, you know, as the, as the beds fill, you know, you can't turn people away, so they just put the mattresses down for all the emergency cases. And here you see the metal sterilization bins on the side. And there's lots of Tristel. I'm sure that many of us remember Tristel for disinfection. And all the uh, single-use stuff is just used again and again and again, as so it basically falls apart. And I've already started collecting bin bags full of disposable equipment from my hospital, which I'll be taking out with that next time. So we arrived on Saturday. It's quite a long journey to get out there, I can assure you. And then by Sunday, we were in there, you know, picking who we're going to operate on that week. And these people may have traveled for two or three days, you know, to come to us. And then I'd had chosen a large number of patients. And we whittled it down to about 12 patients. And we chose a broad spectrum of sort of stricture uh, pathology. They were nasty strictures, there's no doubt about it. Nine, 10 centimeter near obliterations, fistulae, pelvic fracture, you know, urethral injury. And these people have had suprapubic catheters in for years and years. And there's a very good phrase in Phil's, you know, video, the Lancet, financial catastrophe. This is what they have, financial, you know, <coughs> catastrophe. They can't work properly with suprapubics in. They can't provide for their family. They are very disadvantaged, you know, by suffering with these severe strictures. Monday to Thursday, we operated all day. We did two urethroplasties, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and maybe a small case in a, in a theatre, you know, just nearby with a range of, you know, posterior urethroplasties. And revising the urethroplasties they had previously done, because they have this, you know, and I know that not everyone here does urethroplasty, but they, you know, they were marsupializing the bulbar urethra. And then at the second stage, just turning that skin into a tube, which is a, a recognized technique, but a bad technique. And so some of the problems we're dealing with are revisions of their, you know, urethroplasties. Here you can see the uh, operating theatre, and where's the laser? Again, here's a problem there. No running water, so that blue butt there gets filled to the brim, and then when the water goes off, which was a fairly regular occurrence, you go and wash your hands and wash the equipment and what have you there. There's a layer of scum on the top of that water, and when the scum got too bad, you've got to open up bags of intravenous normal saline and scrub with that instead. This picture here, this arty black and white one, which David took, is also showing a lack of staff. There were times when the staff would sort of not be around or not be particularly helpful. And on Friday morning, we lectured. The good things about going out to the Osaka is you really feel that the three consultants out there want to improve. They want the best. You know, they want to provide a really good service, and you really feel like they're engaging with what you know, Euralink wants to do with them. The equipment was good, it wasn't perfect. It was difficult for me with my <coughs> OCD to carry out operations without my precise needle holder and my precise light. But you know, it was good for me. But you know, the equipment is okay. Anesthesia is very good as well. They have a MMED uh, degree running out there of four years, which is supported by international anesthetists. And when we were there, there was a senior registrar from Leeds doing a, a year-long goopy who's training the anesthetists out there. So actually, I hadn't given it much consideration before, but anaesthetics was at a good level. The problems are urology needs its own department, but one of the bigger problems is the attitude, I think, from the scrub uh, nurses and, and the, and the theatre staff. The things I list there, poor staff morale, reluctance to work after lunch, and if you overrun, God help you. Well, that could apply to any NHS <laughs> hospital, really, couldn't it? But actually, if I understood the story correctly, four years ago, the Zambian nurses went on strike over pay. And so the government did something fairly remarkable. It sacked every single nurse in Zambia, every single one. They all had to reapply for jobs, and they were not allowed to go back to the hospital they were previously in. Imagine what that would do for your morale. Twelve months ago, operating theatres ran from eight till one. It is a new concept to work after lunch over there, and you certainly do feel that. We did overrun. You know, I, I, the strictures were difficult to do, and uh, 
you know, they're hard work. And so if, when we did overrun, the following morning, uh, the staff just don't come in. They're tired. They didn't come into work. And in fact, when you do overrun, you have to hand out the Zambian kwacha, you know, the currency out there, so they can all get taxes home. So you're handing over all your money, and then they're just getting on their bicycles outside the ward and cycling home with their taxi money. The equipment servicing is fairly erratic, bipolar, has to be borrowed from elsewhere. And although I was reassured that HIV rates in Zambia were fairly low when I was thinking of going, the HIV rates in the stricture population are incredibly high, and this is all STDs and gonococcal illness. I feel sorry for the guys out there that were trying to train because there are no beginner's strictures. There's no nice straightforward two centimeter stricture in the mid proximal bulb you can put a graft in. They're all you know, pretty horrendous. So they have to learn on the ones that I'm doing after a thousand cases that even I find you know, a bit tricky. So it's gonna be difficult, but you know, I'll go back out there and keep training them. And also they have this poor stricture management. They just blindly dilate in the peripheries, even when they're making massive false pastures and making everything worse. We just need to train the people away from Lusaka to just put superpubics in and leave alone. So the plans are to return next year, probably in March. Certainly David and I are going out there and do further mentoring. And we'll have a look at what they've done <coughs> in between. We are providing support by staying in touch. And indeed, recently, uh, Victor sent through some photos on our WhatsApp messaging group of a very successful, you know, penile urethroplasty he had done, which is exactly like the one that we showed them, you know, on the Thursday. And that's very gratifying. We need to change the way the peripheries are just blindly dilating and making strictures worse. You know, and we need to change the way they uh, do their urethroplasty techniques. But they realize now that, you know, bulbous, bulbous urethral skin, sorry, perineal skin coming into the bulbous urethra, you know, is not ideal. I was here last year in the audience because I was thinking to myself, I'd like to get involved in this sort of you know, Eurolink thing. And I was lucky enough to be asked by Susie Ben to, to go out there. And I think that I will continue to go out there. You know, I'm back out there for the next three years. I'm involved in the Awasa projects. I'm out in Ethiopia in December. And for those of you sitting there thinking, well, I'd like to do it, you know, it, is, it is deeply satisfying on, on many levels. They really need you. They're very grateful. It's challenging working outside of your comfort zone, but it also raises your game as a surgeon. You know, you are doing the more difficult spectrum. You come back, you appreciate the NHS more, and you find the operations, it sounds, you know, arrogant, you find the operations fairly easy. You know, you cut your operating times and what have you. So I definitely will continue to be, uh, you know, part of Eurolink for the future, and I'd, I'd recommend anyone thinking about it to get involved. Thank you.